Between the millions of viewers and the hundreds of awards, Game of Thrones was a phenomenon rarely seen in television. Yet the very first episode was initially one of the most flawed hours of TV ever produced. Boring and confusing, it showed none of the drama and the excitement people came to expect with the series. It took a beloved novel and made it nothing more than a shit show. Before novelist George R.R. R. Martin was known as the guy not finishing a book, he had a long career of writing a lot. Starting in 1971, he published over 20 works before his latest novel failed in 1983. Struggling to sell his next novel, he kind of fell into Hollywood. In 1985, he met a producer who hired him as a writer on a revival of Rod Sterling's The Twilight Zone. But the show didn't last long. Martin then worked on other series, like Beauty and the Beast and Max Headroom. Again, didn't last. He tried writing several pilots, but none of them got picked up for a full series. Throughout, he was told consistently to dial back his scripts because they'd be way too expensive to produce. After six years of this, he just got sick of the system. He retreated back home to write novels once again, where he could be unrestrained in his creativity. He deliberately sat down to write something that was unproducible. It was 1991. Uh, I was actually writing another novel, and just one day, the first chapter of Game of Thrones came to me the scene where they find the dire wolf pups in the, in the summer snows. It, it was a scene that haunted me. Uh, the characters seemed so real. Martin kicked off his medieval fantasy epic, A Song of Ice and Fire, when he published the 700-page A Game of Thrones in August of 1996. A novel that shunned most fantasy trappings in favor of gritty sex scenes and unspeakable violence. While it received fantastic reviews, copies did not fly off the bookshelves. It wasn't until the second novel in 1998 that Ice and Fire hit the bestsellers list. Hollywood came around with mild interest in adapting it. However, after Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter both released in 2001 as film juggernauts, every fantasy novel series was being picked up in an attempt to replicate that success. At that point, Martin had three books, and producers really wanted in. Yet they all wanted to make movies out of the series, something Martin was adamantly against. He knew that his work would be completely neutered, cut down for runtime, and a PG-13 rating. There's a young blacksmith who wakes up one morning with a plan, and his wiener gently hangs down between his legs. Soft and flaccid, his wiener glistens in the golden sunlight. No, no, can we skip the wiener stuff and just get to the dragons? One writer who was asked to adapt the novels was David Benioff. Much like Martin, Benioff was also an author who landed in Hollywood to adapt his own work, like his novel The 25th Hour. From there, his relatively short resume includes ups and downs like Troy, The Kite Runner, and X-Men Origins Wolverine. Along the way, he befriended Daniel Brett Weiss, a screenwriter with zero produced films and only one published novel. Together, they discovered the richness of Ice and Fire. So I started reading George's, the first book, A Game of Thrones. I got about 200 pages into it. I got to the scene where Bran gets pushed out of the tower, tower window, and I fell in love with it, became obsessed. I called Dan and said, you need to check out these books because I might be crazy, but I think this could be the greatest series of all time. As they read on, they reached a pivotal moment in the third book, a wedding, shall we say, and they were convinced it would be something audiences had never experienced before. They became dead set on making Martin's series must see TV. In early 2006, Weiss and Benioff sat down with Martin for lunch for four hours. The writers listened to Martin's reservations about the pros and cons of adapting books, which Martin knew firsthand. They stressed the absolute need for Ice and Fire to be a TV series and laid out their plan for each book being one season. What we thought we were facing was a real uphill battle of trying to explain to him why he should avoid all of these film offers and accept this, these two guys who've never made a television show before in their lives as the, the shepherds of his baby. To prove their love of Martin's work, the writers were asked who they thought was Jon Snow's mother, a mystery the books still have yet to answer. Their guess, whether correct or not, convinced Martin that these guys were serious and he gave them his blessing. They then agreed that there was only one place that would risk investing in something this vast and not shy away from the sex and violence. And that place was HBO. Pre-2000, American television had been, by and large, on autopilot. 
especially one-hour dramas. Decades of shows pumping out 24 episodes a year for seasons on end. Quality would waver, headliners would move on, and creativity sank. TV was widely and obviously second fiddle to movies. But at the turn of the 21st century, as network series suffered, premium cable said hold my beer. HBO was an alternative to pay-per-view, a cable channel known for housing the biggest movies unedited for content for a monthly price. When they began producing their own original series, like The Wire, Six Feet Under, and most importantly, The Sopranos, they also led the revival of must-see TV. With a smaller episode count, no restrictions on sex and violence, and a lax attitude on premiere dates, writers felt creatively unchained, and prestige television was born. Other channels followed suit, with AMC making the biggest impact with their one-two punch of Breaking Bad and Mad Men, forcing network TV to respond with high-concept series like 24 and Lost. It was a new golden age of television. And thanks to the rise of streaming platforms like Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu, it was suddenly possible to catch up on all these new buzzworthy shows. Binging became a thing. Not to be outdone, HBO started producing shows with budgets that rivaled Hollywood blockbusters, long before Netflix dumped billions into their originals. From the lavish Rome to the Steven Spielberg-produced miniseries, The Pacific, which until WandaVision held the record for the most expensive TV show ever made, coming in at $20 million per episode. HBO obviously wasn't afraid of cost or genres. Television is largely run by writers. The showrunners who are in charge of shows are writers 95% of the time. That's why we're in a golden age of TV, because TV is where the real drama is. TV is where the real writers are. Only a few weeks after their lunch with Martin, Weiss and Benioff were pitching a multi-million dollar series to HBO. They emphasized that the show wouldn't be effects driven or morally black and white. Instead, it would be an intense family drama where the battles took place off screen, good versus evil was relative, the violence would be shocking, and the sex would not be romanticized. Lord of the Rings meets Sopranos. But their mic drop moment was the main twist of Martin's first book. What if the hero dies? Ned losing his head hooked HBO. They loved the idea of a drama where no character was safe. However, they didn't commit to anything. So Weiss and Benioff tried pitching to HBO's competitor, Showtime, but they instantly choked at the potential costs. It took nearly a full year before HBO was ready for such an undertaking. And in January of 2007, they gave Weiss and Benioff the green light to write a pilot. Weiss and Benioff spent two years writing episode one and plotting a potential season. Though the 2007 writer's strike delayed them a bit and several drafts were made, they believe their script landed perfectly between faithful adaptation and an engrossing television for viewers who had never heard of A Song of Ice and Fire. HBO agreed, and in November of 2008, they bought the television rights for Martin's novels and ordered the production of a pilot. Weiss and Benioff were set as the showrunners, with Martin co-producing. HBO was going out on a limb. Outside of maybe the cheaply made Hercules and Xena Warrior Princess, Live-action high fantasy had no comparisons of success. Weiss and Benioff had to prove that the genre could work on TV just as well as it had in movie theaters. They got to work building a cast and crew. The first to sign on was Tom McCarthy, the actor-turned-director, who wrote and directed two critically acclaimed indie films. He was between projects and saw directing the pilot as an interesting challenge. From the onset, Weiss and Benioff wanted two very particular actors, Peter Dinklage, and Sean Bean. It helped that McCarthy was a close friend to Dinklage, whose career jump-started after The Station Agent, a part that McCarthy specifically wrote for him. Dinklage was everyone's first choice to play Tyrion Lannister, George Martin's personal favorite character. Martin truly believed that if Dinklage didn't sign on, the show wasn't worth making. Weiss and Benioff sold Dinklage on a complex character that wasn't a bearded dwarf or a magical creature, but a real human being. After that, Sean Bean, who worked with Benioff on Troy, gladly leapt at playing the hero for once, the Honorable Patriarch Ned Stark. Though his fate wouldn't be any different.
With two acclaimed actors on board, the next obstacle was finding several young actors to play Ned Stark's children. An exhaustive worldwide search had to turn up kids who were talented from the start, as the entire Ice and Fire series revolved around them, and that meant actors with multi-year arcs of some truly dark stuff. Hundreds of auditions later, most would agree they lucked out big time. On October 24th, 2009, four years after that lunch with George R. R. Martin, production on Game of Thrones began. But no matter how well Weiss and Benioff thought they were prepared for this moment, they couldn't be further from the truth. Immediately they were out of their depth, confused and scrambling on a daily basis. Standing in front of a crew of a hundred strong, they didn't know most of their names or what any of them did. And McCarthy wasn't much help either. As someone who hadn't handled a production of that size before, and wasn't involved in the scripting phase, the self-admitted perfectionist felt that he was a hired hand, there to just follow instructions. Everything felt half-baked, but simultaneously overthought. Nobody considered having people kneel during the arrival of King Baratheon, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms. Yet, nearly everyone in the cast wore overly distracting wigs like it was a Vegas dance number. Filming in Scotland and Ireland went without any major issues, but when production reached Morocco, it was like everyone gave up. And to add insult to injury, the horses on set would not behave, from refusing to do stunts, to one in particular getting far too excited about being in a wide shot of a sex scene. Horses have one quality that is unmatched by any other mode of transportation. What's that? Ah! Filming wrapped in 26 days. Then the Morocco set was hit with a hurricane and washed out to sea. After editing it together, Weiss and Benioff showed the pilot to close friends and fellow screenwriters Craig Mazin, Ted Griffin, and Scott Frank. And watching them watch that original pilot was one of the most painful experiences of my life. I mean, it's probably like appendicitis and that. And Craig, as soon as it finished, Craig said, You guys have a massive problem. <laughs> the pilot didn't work on almost any level. The camera didn't seem interested in the lush sets or environment, removing any sense of scale. Considering how expensive the project was, it felt small like the entire thing was filmed in an LA parking lot. The dialogue avoided fantasy tropes so much that it overcorrected into incoherent and meaningless. The stakes seemed low, the acting felt stilted. A majority of the actors have since owned up to not being fully engaged for the shoot. The discovery of the direwolf pups, the scene that was the impetus for George R.R. R. Martin's entire saga, came off flat, with no feeling of awe or wonderment. The pilot ends with the shocking revelation that Jamie and Cersei Lannister, twin siblings, are involved in a sexual relationship. And to keep that secret, they push Ned's son Bran out of a tower window. The things I do for love. <laughs> but since everything before that moment was a confusing mess, viewers had no idea the twins were even related. And overall, it was just plain boring. $10 million for an epic fantasy, and they ended up with a knockoff episode of Downton Abbey. For what it's worth, this version followed the book far closer than the final aired episode, and Martin actually liked it. But the one thing the pilot clearly demonstrated was promise. Despite all the faults, the pieces were mostly there. HBO had around 10 pilots in production at the time, and was only going to greenlight about half of them for a full series. They knew how disastrous Game of Thrones went, and wanted to see if the producers would come clean. So in a meeting with the programming director, Weiss and Benioff fell on their swords. Instead of pointing fingers and bullshitting their bosses, they owned up to every mistake and accepted that they only had themselves to blame. They admitted the pilot wasn't good, but they detailed exactly why and how to fix it, scene by scene. The final cut and all their notes were passed up to the president of HBO, the man who would make the ultimate decision. Four months after filming, they feared what that decision was going to be. No. Yes. No. Yes. HBO was really on the fence about whether or not they were going to let this go to series, and those were four of the longest months of both of our lives. 
sitting there thinking every day that this thing that was a once in a lifetime opportunity that's never going to come by again, and we f***ed it up. Whether it was Weiss and Benioff's conviction to do right by George R. R. Martin, or their pleading to redeem themselves, or perhaps it was just a sunk cost fallacy situation, HBO greenlit Game of Thrones for a full season. They recognized the potential and gave Weiss and Benioff their second chance. They got to work on rewriting the pilot, and nine more episodes. Per HBO's instructions, a few of the roles were requested to be recast, the biggest being Tamsin Merchant, who played Daenerys Targaryen, the underdog anti-hero of Ice and Fire. Without a doubt, it would have been a star-making role, as it certainly was for her replacement, Amelia Clark. Also, Jennifer Ely, cast as Ned's wife, Catelyn, had a change of heart about moving to Ireland, and Michelle Fairley replaced her. Because the two major recastings required lots of pickups, and the child actors had aged by nearly a full year at that point, it was decided to reshoot nearly all of the pilot for consistency. HBO pulled in director Tim Van Patten, a veteran for the channel, having worked on nearly every HBO original series to that point. Tom McCarthy was not interested in returning. However, because the entire season would be made at the same time, episodes 3, 4, and 5 were shot before Van Patten was available to reshoot the pilot. And when he did, Weiss and Benioff saw one shot of Van Patten's and modeled the rest of the series look off of it. To save time and money, they shot everything on digital cameras. Around 90% of the first episode was reshot. And because of the film grain, you can see all that remains of the original pilot, which will never see the light of day. Game of Thrones premiered on April 17th, 2011. The renewed pilot was better in every way. It ditched the confusing flashbacks and the distracting wigs. Relationships were clear, the stakes were immediate, it had a grander scope, and performances were great all around. Even though the first episode had a far lower amount of viewers than HBO was looking for, it only took two days until HBO renewed Game of Thrones for second season. They knew the potential of this series, and how they could build on it. By the end of the season, after Ned lost his head, HBO had one of the greatest and iconic water cooler moments in television history. It was nominated for 13 Emmys, including Outstanding Drama Series. Tim Van Patten was nominated for Outstanding Directing for the pilot, and Peter Dinklage won Outstanding Supporting Actor. Via word of mouth, DVD sales, and constant promotion, by season four, Game of Thrones became the most watched series in HBO's history, and every season's audience was more than the years previous, with millions jumping onto the hype train, whether they were fantasy fans or not. By the series end with season 8 in 2019, it became the second highest Emmy nominated series, and was undoubtedly one of the most popular TV shows ever made. Dan Weiss and David Benioff redeemed themselves and in the process, changed television forever. And I think we'd all agree, they maintain that level of quality throughout. And are you happy with how things ended? Yes. Huh? <laughs> she didn't say yes. You didn't say yes. Best season ever. <laughs> no. Winner, winner, winner.